uh, from the University of Maryland, right? And his topic, as you can see here, uh, Black Male Initiative Program, Improving Black Male Retention uh, via Civic Engagement, Academic Excellence, Culture, Edification, and Community. So um, uh, no, without further ado, we're going to ask all of you to come forward, uh, hold your questions to the end of the session, and make sure that you go into your bags that you were given at the beginning of the conference to do the evaluation forms. That information is extremely important for us for the next conference next year. Okay? Thanks a lot. Thank you. Appreciate it. So I'm going to, because the close confines of the room, I'm going to move around and try to stay out of the way of the, um, the screen so that you can see the PowerPoint. There's some data that's there. But um, most importantly, I, I hope that at the end of this um, presentation that, you know, you can take my card, um, I can get your card, and we can exchange because what we've done at, at University of Maryland, at, uh, namely the Nimburu Cultural Center with the Nimburu Black Male Initiative Program, is something that, that we hope continues to, to serve as inspiration to other programs throughout the country that can be replicated, that can be built on. We don't see the empowering of, of black men, the, this crisis that, that we're looking at in terms of retention rates, um, even looking at prior to um, black men getting to college, the, the, the low graduation rates coming out of high school, we don't look at it as something that should be seen as some kind of competition. We see, that, see it as something that should be shared, that it should be a, a village type effort. Uh, folks across the board, administrators, professor, pro, professors, um, community members, parents, grandparents coming together to work towards improving uh, this, this situation, vastly improving the situation. So without further ado, um, the BMI, my name is Solomon Kamashan, and I'm uh, the assistant director for the Nomburo Cultural Center, uh, which is this building right here, which is located uh, in the heart of University of Maryland College Park, right next to the Stamp Student Union. If you guys are familiar with the campus, perhaps you've, you've been there, you've seen the building itself, uh, but it's right next to the, uh, the Stamp Student Union uh, in front of the bus stops. And in 2005, myself and, and Dr. Ronald Ziegler and two students, Raheem Duardo and Hank Rollison, uh, started this program. We were actually approached by those two young men who at the time were very strong student leaders on campus. One was the president of the NAACP chapter on campus. The other one was the president of the BSU. And they, they um, took matters into their hands and they contacted us and call for a meeting because they saw it as an issue that many of their peers, especially uh, their, their male peers, had never had the experience of having a black professor teach them. They didn't have any black male um, uh, mentors on campus who are administrators. Um, they, they said that you know most of our peers don't have this experience. Uh, and so, you know, we came together, we decided to start this program, we created the Black Male Initiative Program, that also at the time, in 2005, the black male retention rate on the campus of University of Maryland was 28%, 28%. And as we know, retention rates, um, there's a lot of factors that can contribute to retention rates. So one thing that jumps into people's minds most of the time, they think, oh, it's just, you know, it's just academic. Well, some, it's for academic reasons, others, it's because of withdrawal from, that comes from being on a predominantly white institution. And I'm not gonna pull, hold, pull any punches. If I don't on campus, I'm not gonna do it certainly here. I, I work at that university. Um, it's not the most welcoming place for students of color. And that's one of the things that we're you know, pushing for right now. I'm the, also the president of the Black Faculty and Staff Association on campus. And during my tenure within that position, um, that's something that we continue to, to vigorously uh, push and, and, and agitate the, admin the administration to, to do better, and, but at the same time doing what we can do um, on campus as a black faculty and staff association to, to um, reach out to young men and women of color on campus, and we started a mentoring program. We have a BFSA mentoring program on campus, but even when you look at the numbers between young black men and young black women who are undergraduates and students, uh, the black men you know, and, and this, this, this goes along with national trends, uh, happen to be the, the, the cohort who is, you know, has the lowest retention rates, has the lowest, you know, graduation rates and so forth. So um, we came up with this, this, is, this would be our mission, you know, the 
Black Male Initiative Program is dedicated to the establishment of brotherhood, scholarship, and retention of black males at the University of Maryland. Tim will give you one of our things, uh, one of our um, handbills a little bit later that has this, this uh, mission on the front and has some information on the back. BMI has a commitment to impact the campus and wider communities through collective activism and leadership that promotes the uplifting and empowerment. All right, it should be empowerment of black men. Uh, it was something that was left off. One of the ideals, this is our philosophy, one of the ideals within the leadership of BMI is that no leader can truly be effective if they are not well informed about critical issues that impact their community. What we mean by this is that as we, and we have within our program, and we'll get into that, we have, a, we have a study hall, we have a weekly study hall that is maintained by students. So as elders on campus, faculty and administrators alike that are involved in the, in the BMI program, and that's one of the things I'm trying to like, as well as Dr. Z and, and, and other folks who are involved, we're trying to push more and more um, administrators, especially black men on campus who are administrators and professors to get involved in our, in our program. And, we, and it's not out of lack of promoting. We get the word out across the board. All right, on my listserv, as, um, as president of BFSA, I have 800 members on that listserv. We continue to send out, you know, um, um, just pleas for, for black men to come to our meetings and, and get involved. And, and we simply have about a handful that are involved right now. But one of the things that, that we really hold near and dear and, and, and we're, we're very, very um, steadfast at is empowering these young men to beyond the scholarship. The scholarship is, is important. We want you to make the grade. We want you to excel academically, serve as paragons academically, not just within your peer group, but throughout the campus and throughout your communities. Um, we want you to go on to, and, and to graduate. And, and, to, and if, if you decide to go to, to you know, if you decide to, to go to a graduate school, um, we want you to, to go there and excel as well. If you decide to go into the professional realm, we want you to go there and excel as well. But one of the things it's that we really drill and inculcate to them is that you have a responsibility. There are some vast issues. There are some vast issues, and I think this is what really kind of makes us unique on campus and even um, across the nation is that we, we don't shy away from political issues. We don't shy away from political issues that some would, you know, that some, have, some folks have kind of wrongfully, some folks that are in our positions have really done young men and women a disservice by continuing to promote this idea that we're living in some kind of post-racial or post-racist society, which we are not. There's a prison industrial complex. The, the issue of mass incarceration, look at New York City, Philadelphia, San Francisco now, with the stop and frisk situation. We're talking about millions and millions of young men, mostly young men of color, who have been subject to these stop and frisk policies. And some of the stop and frisk leads to police brutality because they don't always go smooth. So we so we, we discuss this. We do know your rights with uh, within BMI. We, our matter of fact, our last our last uh, meeting, our last general meeting, we meet once a month, at, um, always on a Tuesday, one Tuesday a month, from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. and we serve dinner uh, um, and we address a certain issue. So last session, uh, as we do every semester, because the students ask for it, is to do a know your rights, a know your rights uh, program, because on our campus. Our campus is also not immune to racial profiling. Uh, teaching them the, you know, their rights, you know, um, if they're accosted by the police, you know, you know, keeping their cool, uh, identifying badge numbers, asking, am I, am I being detained? All this kind of, all this kind of stuff. Uh, the, the Bill of Rights, we cover all that. And so we tell them that that with all these issues that are going on right now, within the communities that that, that we come from. You can't just take this elitist attitude and say, hey, I'm on a co college campus, and therefore I'm going to turn my back to brothers and sisters from my, from my community, and I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm not going to try to reach back and pull up you know, some other brothers. And, that's, and uh, this is a segue. I, I'm going to get into some of the activism, the programs, because we, felt, we feel that the retention was not just, it, it clearly was not into academic, it was withdrawal. And so one of the ways to actually try to get young men to buy into coming back an, an additional semester, an additional semester, was to have them a part of something that was bigger than themselves. Have them a part of something that, if you're not going to be around the next semester, 
there's going to be a huge vacuum to be filled. And we need you to come back. And these young men that you're mentoring at Greenbelt Elementary School and some of these other elementary schools and at the Oak Hill, which is now the new beginning of Juvenile Detention Center, uh, we started a prison at college pipeline program there, and we'll, we'll get into that, that there's going to be a, a vacuum because of your absence. So we need you. We need you to excel academically, and we need you to come back and to continue to exert your responsibility as young leaders on campus as well as with these young people that are in these schools that you're mentoring or at the juvenile detention center where they're incarcerated because it's a it's a uh, it's a reentry program that we that we were part of starting uh, several years ago. Um, so our leadership, as we say, is in no way, shape, form, or fashion rooted in incessant discussions about these critical issues. We candidly discuss them, um, but we also you know, push our members towards working actively to improving them. Our leadership is greatly uh, um, geared towards activism rooted in strengthening and improving our, our, our communities. Challenges that we face on campus, um, one, of the camp one of the challenges I, I just got mentioned is, uh, is, you know, the, let me just not, yeah, programs that, have, that, that deal with, with, with race and racism and, and you could say institutions racism, uh, facets of that. But disengagement and isolation, limited self-awareness, we wanted them to be aware of, of who they are. I'm, and I'm, I'm not making this up, and I'm sure I don't have to convince any of you in here that I'm making this up, but we, I can't tell you how many young men that before coming to BMI came in and we have these open, these open um, meetings where young men would, would, would say, you know, this is the first time I've really I, I really felt comfortable to really exert and express myself as, 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 as a black man. And, and really, this is the first time that I've, I've had heard discussions of folks talking about, you know, that, that, that you know, about our origins as, as, as African people. And, and you know, I, I, you know, since coming to this campus, you know, I've, I've felt that I, I've had to kind of suppress that um, and, and, you know, and bite my, my, you know, bite my tongue, and bite my lip, you know, when it came to discussing things that, that had to do with my experience as a black man in America, and this is the first time I've, I've felt like I had an outlet, a venue to, to express myself politically, culturally, and otherwise. And so we, we have a, a rites of passage program that we put them through, um, so to speak. And at the end of, of the semester, they, they're actually put through a rites of passage uh, ceremony that's done by one of our BMI members who's a community member who happens to be an Akan, uh, uh, Akan priest from Ghana. Uh, or he was trained in Ghana, and so he, he puts them through a rites of passage ceremony. It's a beautiful thing, and we do that for each uh, successive graduating class uh, of, of members of, of, BMI, of the BMI program. Feelings of marginalization, feelings of being misunderstood. Uh, uh, they've some, a lot of members initially just accepted stereotypes, kind of accepted the stereotypes that, that you know, were abound and, and kind of just, you know, just allow that to be absorbed within them. And, and so, you know, we, we had to go through that whole process of, of, of saying that these accept these stereotypes, they don't come out of the blue. You know, these stereotypes have been created long, long time ago uh, for the intent reason that we're discussing right now. So some of the national, just to give you a, a snapshot, I know this is old hat for, for probably everybody in this room. Uh, you're probably all familiar with, with some of these stats, if not all of them, looking at 47% of black males, uh, black male students graduated on time at, um, from U.S. high schools in 2008, compared to 78% of white males. Um, in 2002, black men comprised only 4.3% of students enrolled at institutions of higher education, the exact same percentage that we saw in 1976. Black male students, uh, black male college completion rates are the lowest among both sex sexes, as well as uh, all racial, you know, um, slash ethnic groups. Um, undergraduate men, uh, uh, like some other uh, racial minority students at predominantly white institutions, routinely encounter racist stereotypes, kind of like the ones I just discussed, and racial microaggressions that undermine their achievement and sense of belonging. So th these are kind of, and then you look at the also the cohorts and looking at the six-year graduation rate of black male uh, students attending public colleges and universities. 30, was 33% uh, compared to 48% uh, 
of, of students so far. And I want to point this out. Also, this, there's one that I didn't put up there. And there's, this, is, this one I think is really also uh, important. Black men are overrepresented as rev uh, on revenue generating intercollegiate uh, athletic uh, sports teams such as basketball and, um, you know, and, and football. Uh, in 2009, they were, they were only 3.6% of uh, all undergraduate students, but comprised 55.3% of football and basketball players at public Division I institutions. Um, and that's from this one. Uh, this is a really good uh, resource. The, uh, uh, it was put out by uh, Penn State and Sean Harper, the black male, um, black male student success at higher, uh, in higher education, and that's available online. And if you don't have that, you, once we exchange emails, I can send it to you. But the whole PDF is available online for free. Um, why we started BMI? Why we specifically started BMI? We started BMI to get more black undergraduate men involved in campus life, create more opportunities for black men to get involved uh, in general, improve retention rates, obviously, with 28% now. And we're nowhere where we want to be. Um, but right now on campus, it's about 60, 61%. Uh, so we. we see an improvement. We, we think that that improvement is probably coming from, from different venues on campus, but we'd like to think that, that, that we're one of the, uh, the, the organs on campus that, that significantly played a role in, in improving this retention rate to 61%. And, and obviously, we have uh, much more lofty goals than 61%. Than we want to continue to push that as much as we possibly can towards 100%, uh, empowering um, uh, and, and you, obviously you can't do that, even if the, the academics are there, you can't do that if, if the culture on campus is not welcoming for students of color, then you can have an academically, as I've seen before, academically talented students of color decide to transfer to go someplace else that is more welcoming, that has a, a more welcoming uh, atmosphere on campus. And I just kind of give you a historical um, snapshot of, of University of Maryland. Um, I work in the Black Cultural Center was it six, six, seven years ago? Like we, we had a noose hung in front of our, in front of our building. Um, you know, all the major corporate media outlets, you know, came and that, you know, that tells you something because oftentimes they turn a blind eye to a lot of issues that are in the black community. But they, they came out, they covered this. It was a huge thing in Cole Fieldhouse. Um, it, we, we have a lot of work to do on campus. A lot of work to do on campus um, as a community. Administrators, um, educators alike, uh, towards creating a, a climate of, of that that is, I, I would say, that is culturally competent. Um, that you know, I, I you know that, that I would say uh, also within that cultural competency is not is beyond tolerance. It's 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 looking at differences as as not deficient, but differences that that should be embraced and and run to as as differences that. Wow, I have a lot to learn from this Native American brother. I've never met a Native American brother, and if I understand, you know, these differences in his struggle, then perhaps, you know, I just might understand why he has a strong aversion to the Washington Football Team's name or Columbus Day. You know, these are the things that that we discuss in in, in our Black Male Initiative uh, program meetings as well. Is to to let you know young these young men know that um, that don't allow this university's shortcomings right now. Be a part of that change. Help push the, 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 the um, level of discourse. Keep pushing, you know, be a part of pushing the, the, um, the specter of consciousness around a lot of these issues that are, that are culturally based. Um, we cover gender. We, we cover gender issues. You know, um, the trials and tribulations of, of women of color and, and women of general looking at, I mean, Al Jazeera American just did a week-long series about the epidemic of women being raped and sexually abused on college campuses. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that is an epidemic, you know? And so we, we, we do programs around that, um, trying to re-trigger. Like, it, it may be socially acceptable amongst some of your, you know, uh, you know, on your, you know, um, within some of the music that you listen to, the, 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 the core, and, and we get into all that stuff. The, the corporate media puts out there in terms of acceptable forms of blackness and brownness from rappers that they that they want to put out there, despite the fact that they suppress folks like Most Dev and that Ruby Sailor. We can go on and on for like talented black and brown and even white 
rappers that are suppressed uh, because of their, their political discourse or their cultural discourse. So it may be acceptable within the corporate media's, you know, corporate media's, uh, uh, or corporate media backed rap to use the word, the, the, the word bitch, you know, or hoe to refer to as woman, but, but we're not doing, we don't do that in, in, in BMI. It is time to reshape it. And so we, we, we address it head on. We say, listen, if you're used to that, if somebody said that about your mama or somebody said about your sister, how would you, well, well, I, I, I'd be ready to beef with them. I, I'd be ready to go head up with them. Well, well why? 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 They're, they're, you know, they, they don't know, you know, and, and so we push that, that, that conversation. Well, you don't know these other women. You don't know them. When you go to the club, it, you know, if someone is getting ready to go to the homecoming party and say, Let, let's go, let's you know, go pick up some bitches tonight. You're talking about women that you haven't even met yet, let alone have seen physically. You're just talking about, and that's that me mentality. And so we've heard, and Tim will, will tell you, I mean, it, it's beautiful things where, where I've had, like, some of my students who are young sisters come into my office. Just happened two weeks ago. Am I right, Tim? Just came into my office, and she said, listen, you know, you know so-and-so? I was like, yeah. She's like, well, that's one of my good friends. He's, a, he's in my dormitory. So he came back after the BMI meeting, came back and said, man, I really got to throw He's like, I, I, I don't ever want to use the N-word again or the B-word, you know, I, you know. And she's like, yo, he used to always use those words. And he came back saying that, that he did not want to use those words. He's like, I, I feel guilty after what I just learned. I feel guilty using those, that, those words. And so it starts there. It starts there because we see them as, all, like, as leaders, not potential leaders, but leaders. And so if we can continue to expose them to information and expose them to perspectives that have oftentimes been suppressed, once they even step off that campus, they are carrying BMI with them, and they are carrying that mentality with them. And so when they, when they go home for the summer, they go home for an inter intercession or a long weekend, and they go and they catch up with some of their other friends who may be at different colleges or, or, or working professionally, and that, those, those, that kind of terminology comes up, now they step into that leadership role and say, listen, no, 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 pump your brakes, no. No, we, you know, did you know this? Did you know this? Did you know about this? Do you know we come from kings and queens, and now we're referring to each other as such and such? You know, so that that's why we, we take it so we take we take it so seriously. So um, we also want to you know help create a stronger bond between black faculty and staff to uh, black undergraduate men. But it also we, we actually do a, a great job at BFSA um, connecting to. And now here's the thing: we have I just told I told you the Black Faculty and Staff Association. We have a, a mentoring program for undergraduate students of color who are primarily, who are the vast majority are, 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 are of African ancestry or are, are black. But the vast majority of those that we've sent out, because I, I have a listserv that reaches out to every single student that identifies themselves as being black when they come into the university, that's 3,200, 3,200. And I'm trying to tell you, I would say about 95% of, yeah, it, easily. It, um, if I, yeah, I would say 90 to 95% of the folks that asked to be mentored were women, young women, young black women. And we know that there's a lot, and, and so we also, and so I see you nodding your head, that the other, the, the other part of that is that a lot of brothers, you know, have kind of, you know, this built up kind of uh, false sense of machismo. And so, you know, we bring in um, um, folks who are in the counseling center who are black, trained you know, uh, doctors of psychology who work in the counseling center on campus to come and talk about what they do and, to, and then to, to talk about their, their walking hours because they specifically in the counseling center have, uh, during the week, they have uh, um, uh, uh, minority student walk-in uh, uh, hours you know, that are done, I think, two or three times a week. And if that doesn't work, then you can make an appointment because oftentimes we've seen a lot of brothers, they, they, they're going through different issues. They might have broken up, you know, have gone through a rat breakup, have um, uh, issues with their families or what have you, uh, pressure of school, and they keep this stuff pent up, pent up. And if you continue to keep it pent up, it manifests itself, and then it comes to this crescendo, and you, you have a meltdown. And so um, we want them to, to know about these resources, that it's okay to release. It's, you know, it's okay to come, come to my office or go to... Dr. Richardson's office or Dr. Ziegler's office and, and talk to us about it because we have resources and then we can we can funnel you over to Dr. Ted Pickett who is a member of BMI and you know and take it from there. The, you know we don't see the elders within BMI uh, like myself. We don't 
take mentoring as like a kind of a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm just going to be dealing with you. We take it as, okay, because I may not be in one day. I may be out ill or I might be at a conference or something like that. And so if you know it's this village type of atmosphere that we're from that, that, that is within this organization, and I'm not in that day, you, can go to Dr. you know you can go to Dr. Richardson because he's your mentor too. He's an elder in your village as well. You can go to Dr. Ziegler. You can go to Ren McGrew because they're a part of your, your they're, they're a part of your village as well. So we, we, we take the responsibility that we're all mentoring these young men. We're all mentoring the, these young men, not just one on one. And then, so they take that kind of responsibility when they go to Greenbelt Elementary School and some of the other places that we've um, infiltrated. Uh, we de developed a, out of the BMI program, we developed and, and wrote a course, Dr. Ziegler and myself, we teach it every year, EDCP 108N, Perspectives of Black Male Leadership, and that's an actual course now. We created that course, um, and uh, um, it, like I said, it's taught every fall semester. We teach on Mondays. Uh, we do social bonding, um, uh, social bonding you know, through outings. We attend conferences, Wizards games. Uh, we attended the Millions Man's March together back in, gosh, when was that? No, not, not the first, not the second one. Two thousand. Two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we attended that together. Uh, we went to New York. We've been on a program in New York uh, on B and BCAS Studios. It's on public access, where we went to a. a, a uh, it's called Black Men Screaming, and it's run by this brother by, and hosted by this brother named Maurice Carney. And um, so he, you know, he's come down here, and, and we facilitated symposiums, and he's helped host uh, actual lot like TV shows in the borough, which is where our meetings are held. Uh, BMI movie nights, community nights, once a month. It's a Wednesday. A Wednesday, one Wednesday a month, we show a documentary that has to do with a uh, social issue. And we have a talk back, a robust talk back session after that. Or the other end is sometimes we don't show movie. We'll just have a community dialogue. So last last month we had Eugene Purrier, who is an author who wrote a, a, a brilliant book that was just re released about a month ago called um, Shackled and Chained, Mass Incarceration in Capitalist America, and it gets into the issue of mass incarceration. So he led a, a robust uh, discussion that was very um, engaging, and there's a quid pro quo between him and the audience members. We've done, I mean, you, you name it, we, we've, we've covered it. We could, uh, we've, the death penalty, uh, racial disparities within that, um, discussions around Misogyny, sexism, and we, we, we've covered it all. I mean, so, and, and now it's something that WPFW in, in Washington, D.C., 89.3 FM, we have so many community members. Sometimes we have these movie nights where you actually have more community members coming in from D.C., uh, Prince George's County, and sometimes Baltimore, where we actually have more of them than we actually have students that, that come to these. And so now they're aired on this radio station, they, they actually let folks know a week in advance. Next week on, you know, at Wednesday at 7 p.m. at the Nabooru Cultural Center on the campus of University of Maryland, you're warmly invited to this event. It's free, all our events are free, and uh, we do lectures, we do, I mean, we have barbershop nights that are bonding, we have, you know, where we have local black barbers coming to Nabooru, and they'll, you know, cut hair for like $5 a head, and, and it's just, you know, we'll have like, you know, uh, Sporting events shown on the on the on the wall through the um, the LCD projector. These are all conducive to like bonding. Uh, we have prison to college pipeline program that I just uh, spoke about, where we go into uh, juvenile detention centers. We're actually about to start going into the PG County Jail and under the stewardship of Dr. Joseph Richardson, who's the brother I was telling you about before. Who his area of expertise he teaches on um, car uh, carceral studies prison industrial complex, mass incarceration. Matter of fact, he just wrote a course he's teaching the next semester on the prison industrial complex. He's the only professor I know of on campus that that addresses it from a perspective in terms of how it, how these things have, have really decimated and, and hurt the black community. Um, we have an award recognition um, program which, and that's tied into the rites of passage. And all this stuff is done. I'm going to tell you, all this stuff is done with a, a shoestring budget. 
So these, these are the, this BMI movie night, the prison to college pipeline. This is a description of prison to, co prison to college pipeline. I'm putting what I, what I was just about to say on the table for one, for one moment. Um, critically aware that the prison industrial complex and schools to prison pipeline that is funneling masses of young blacks into prison. Black student leaders, including members of BMI at the University of Maryland College Park, developed a, a, a pipeline program um, you know, that is linking imprisoned youth with college resources and support, where we would go there uh, every, and it's now an SGA, an SGA recognized organization, we go there every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And we would go into the facility and we would conduct um, mentoring programs, critical thinking workshops. Uh, we would do cookouts with the young men. We would do academic training with, with the young men. And initially, I'm gonna try to tell you this once again, because it's no, to be of no secret, sisters outperform their, their black male peers, not just academically, but also when it comes to activism. And that was a problem initially, where we, we had way more sisters that were involved in this program, going to a juvenile detention center that, that housed all young men, 99% of them were black, and 1% of them were Latino. And so, yeah, sisters were, once again, as usual, at the forefront, you know, so, you know, our, our task has really been trying to like really call uh, the black men from campus into these uh, into these programs and to understand why they should be involved. The Greenbelt Elementary School program. I have this one for you. Um, this was a um, a story that was done on our 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 mentoring program at Greenbelt Elementary School that was in the Washington Post a few years ago in 2006. And I'll take one more. So you all oh, that, and that's that's. I mean, that's been a wonderful program. I mean, thus far, and we're about to start a new one at um, mentoring high school students at Northwestern High School. Some of our challenges: insufficient funds, insufficient funding, social distractions, insufficient institutional support. So I, I want to put this. I want to make this very clear. All these successes that we've had, we have yet to be funded. We have yet to be funded in any shape, form, or fashion. Nambru is a self-support um, uh, self support unit on campus, much like athletics is, but we don't have the luxury of going to bowl games and having TV contracts to give us tens of millions of dollars. So a lot of the money that we make outside of our budget, our, um, our, our, our salaries, is for the funding of, of the center, goes to outside organizations that will rent out the center for a Sweet 16, a wedding, reception, those kind of things, a reprise, those kind of things. Um, you know, sometimes student organizations for a nominal fee, they'll rent out um, a multi-purpose room. Tim will tell you that we, we have to do our fundraising, like we have t-shirts that the young men had to go out and they, they do concession stands at the football and basketball games to raise money. So they do those kind of things. Um, you, know, we, you know, all different kinds of things to try to raise money for our program. We have to use, uh, when we order pizzas and, and sandwiches for our meetings, we have to use it out of the borough's budget because we don't have any funding for BMI. Not out of, not trying, and yet, you know, and yes, we, you know, we're, we're continuing to try to like, um, you know, uh, you know, um, apply for more outside uh, 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 grant funding from, from uh, nonprofit organizations, and, and we've been doing that in the past. Over 400 students have participated in the Black Male Initiative program since its beginning in 2005. This is just some of the majors. Everyone, we have, um, we have uh, young men who, who came through the BMI program for four years who are in their final year of residencies, right, residency right now as, as uh, um, emergency care uh, physicians. We have lawyers, we have, um, I mean, you, you, you name it, across the board who have come through BMI and are doing just tremendous things in the communities that, that they occupy right now. Um, so, so this is just a snapshot of some of the majors. Uh, these are some of the, the resources. And I want to show you a quick video just of some of the voices before we finish, of some of the voices from BMI. Um, but this is some of the resources that, that went into uh, putting this together. We, you know, we looked at the cross model digressions, you know, how that study you know, looked at students of color on PWIs and how they went through these different phases and stages um, um, based on the cold 
you know, cultural climate on the, on, on the campuses that they uh, occupy. And uh, these are some of our faculty, staff, um, advisors, myself, Dr. Ziegler, Dr. Richardson, Aaron McGrew. Um, and uh, that I'll give you guys my card. But I want to show you just a uh, quick snapshot. And as I'm pulling this up, Tim, what, what would you say about the BMI program in terms of um, what, what it means, to specific, especially for, for young black men that a lot of who are friends and, and peers of yours? I think that it's a completely unparalleled program, and I think that the program really is more than just a, um, a space where information is provided, but it's really a community program, you know, where bonds are established because, um, especially at a big university like the University of Maryland, it's very hard to find your niche, especially as a freshman. So meeting like-minded like -minded individuals at BMI and then networking with them I think is one of the main re uh, reasons for our success because that community not only of elders and students but students among themselves as through our test bank where we share tests with, you, with each other um, to help us do better on tests. Um, I think that's one of the major contri uh, contributions to. I completely understand why the African Culture Center Nambru would be um, you know, a safe haven for students of color on campus because it's such a hostile um, environment. Like I said, we're working to, to really, because I don't think you can legislate uh, a more progressive approach to diversity. It has to be something that's cultivated. You have to plant the seeds. It has to be cultivated. And so, um, you know, there's folks on campus, you know, um, you, you know, certainly outside of, in the brew and outside of the who are really trying to really push the envelope to create a, um, a more culturally competent uh, environment. And that and, I, and that, also, that also includes, I mean, I, I can't say enough because, uh, uh, the facts are the facts are the facts. That, that also includes, you know, the approach. And it's obviously just not the University of Maryland. This is kind of like a nationwide thing. But also the, the, the culture in terms of how we, how we see young women on campus, how we as, as men, and especially young men, see their, their uh, female counterparts on campus. And, and um, you know, because, it, you know, like I said, the, you know, when you look at some of these stats, like one in five, and one in six, depending on what campus it is, uh, undergraduate women, you know, uh, will be, you know, raped while they're. I mean, that, it's completely unacceptable. I mean, one is too many, but I mean, when you look at one, I, that's awful. And so we look at these young men as change agents that women can can develop programs to help combat this. But until men stop putting their hands on women, you, you know, the issue lies with us. You know, and so, you know, if, if you're not doing it, don't you take a defensive attitude. You take a proactive attitude that, uh, fine, if you're not doing it, you've never done that, you've never mistreated a woman, then it's your duty that when you hear language that can be conducive to leading towards the mistreatment of women, it's your job to step in there as a, as a leader and to facilitate a conversation that goes from that to com the, the complete unacceptance of that kind of language or that kind of mentality. So I just, this is real quick, I just want to show you. Brother from uh, the Black Male Initiative Program at the New Brewer Cultural Center, I just want to ask you, what are some of the benefits that you see from uh, being a part of this organization? Uh, well, the uh, first benefit would be um, brotherhood. Um, something that, uh, you know, I definitely need in my life, you know, um, because uh, as, as one of the brothers even said earlier this evening, you know, that, like when we graduate high school, we graduate college, and we get out here in the real world, you know, a lot of our close friends and our, our brotherhoods, you know, leave us, you know, because we all go our different paths, you know, and this, this right here is, is the most beautiful brotherhood, man, I've found in the D.C. metro area, man, it's, it's encompassing, you know, young professionals, uh, professors like yourself, and, and the college students, you know, we can all come together, you know, and build on how we can improve, you know, the situation of ourselves and our people, you know, so that's, that's one of the big benefits, you know, I walk away you know, very uplifted, you know, by uh, the different contributions, you know, that brothers, brothers come with, you know, as far as what they're doing in the communities to make a difference, you know, and um, that's, 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 that's just a little, little short, short positive. Brown, thanks a lot, brother. Two, uh, two brothers who are members of the Black Male Initiative here at the Nambura Culture Center, I just want to ask you guys real quickly, um, what do you find the benefits of this Black Male Initiative program that you're a part of? What are the benefits? Um, I've been coming to the Black Male Initiative program since uh, September of last year. It was the first time I've been introduced to the organization, and 
I've been coming back pretty steadily because the knowledge that I'm gaining here is knowledge and insights and information that I have not been exposed to uh, in many, many years or, or, or in a lot of the different activities in which I'm engaged in. And additionally, it's an opportunity to meet uh, brothers, people of like mind who are trying to make a difference. And that opportunity in and of itself is what drives me to come back on a regular basis. Right, right. And um, as far as me and Calvin Curtis, um, I've only been to two BMI meetings. And honestly, I can say that uh, there's not too much that I know right now, but I know that it's, it's uplifting. It's insight. You know, it, it, there's a whole lot that any man can come through and, uh, and actually gain some kind of knowledge, you know, because we all, we all need that. And, and that's pretty much where, you know, how I feel as, as a man. You know, any, any, any man should be able to come to BMI and say, hey, look, I learned something today. I don't care if you listen to whatever you listen to, you learn whatever you learned, you did whatever you did. At the end of the day, at 7 o'clock, you can come to a BMI meeting and actually learn something. You know, because the very first time I came, I didn't, I didn't know nothing about what I, what I heard. Nothing at all, and and that's that's why I'm back again. Right. So that that's just you know and that that's on our website the whole you know 15 minute video. But I want to open it up to you for you know the last few minutes we have for any questions, comments. And I have my card. I, I really hope like if there's anything that we can do, if you know, and and I and I want to say this too. I, this is this is one of the things that we say all the time at BMI. If you know brothers, because a lot of the brothers that are part of the, the organization are from the state of Maryland or DC. If you know any brothers that are that could benefit from this, whether they're high school students or or a 31 year old professional, if you know anybody in the DMV that could benefit from this program, we don't have no ivory towers. We don't have any ivory towers. We understand that the University of Maryland historically, the reason why a lot of black people in PG County see the University of Maryland as, as kind of like this this ivory tower on the hill. Is because it has, I mean, it's not a secret, I'm not saying anything like it's controversial. It, it's well known that, that that's the kind of understanding that, that many black folks have of the University of Maryland from the community that they're like, you know, that, that says that place. It, it's never been welcoming to, to like us. And so we say, we are, we're welcoming. So you tell, so, and I would say about two thirds, no, not two thirds, about a third, a third of our membership has no affiliation whatsoever with the University of Maryland. They're, they're professionals like the young brother that was the, the very first one with the, uh, with the beard. Um, they have no affiliation with the University of Maryland. Are, are just regular cash from the DMV that started coming. And they, they liked it the first time, and they kept coming back, coming back, coming back. And we say, listen, bring them in. Um, if there's any qu questions or comments, if there's any, you know, um, we, we would love to build with you.